Hey, and welcome to a very special episode of Connect This. Tonight we are coming to you live from San Antonio, Texas. At the super special. Super special where we hosted, we just got done with day two or day three. One of the days, but anyway, we broke history and we hosted the largest net inclusion conference here in San Antonio, Texas. Tonight we are joined by a great panel of special guests, Executive Director Angela Sieper from NDIA. <laughs> Councilwoman Via Grande, District 3, City of San Antonio. And we, of course, we have our special host, Chris Mitchell. He's going to reintroduce you to the other guests tonight. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. I'm uh, Councilman Phyllis Viagran. Excited to be here today. Uh, excited to be part of this podcast. This was the issue I ran on. Connecting people because of the pandemic, we saw a need. And, and this group, NDIA, has been talking to years that there's a gap, that there's inequity. But we saw that amplified from a pandemic where one of my school districts in the district was left off the grid completely. So we, there was a call to action, we moved. This is one thing that's really important to me and I try and be an advocate on the dais uh, because we knew how essential this was. Part of a winter storm in the middle of the pandemic, we have a winter storm. I'm a digital navigator and so I was trying to connect with one of my seniors during the storm and while I was supposed to try and te teach her iPad essentials, it ended up being a news report of what was going on and when we thought this storm was gonna end for my seniors and those all stuck at home. So this has just been just so important that we get the message out there. Thank y'all so much for coming today and sharing because this is gonna be critical in getting your elected officials and getting just the people out in the neighborhood to be committed to this project. So I'm so glad. If y'all have any questions for me, let me know. Uh, but this is what's important. So I'm deeply curious about more details on you ran on better internet access in the city of San Antonio, one of the larger cities in the United States, people thought it wouldn't resonate, but it did. Tell us more. So it, it resonated because what we learned in the southern sector in particular is that we had maybe two options for internet, and one was spotty internet or very expensive internet, where you are paying way more than your budget should allow for the internet. So that's when we came in and we said, where is the affordability? The government answered with their uh, affordable connectivity pro program. But, but what I learned and what I knew is I needed faster speeds. The speeds were not fast enough. If I was going to give the same opportunity to my residents in District 3, I needed, I needed better connectivity. So now we're having those conversations. We've brought in local groups, our, our grassroots, uh, the Digital Alliance here, San Antonio uh, Digital Connects, and we're trying to bring in the county. We're doing another survey. We did a survey pre-pandemic, the city of San Antonio did, to see what the needs are. We're doing one post-pandemic to see what the challenges are, and we're pushing that out and have incredible feedback to now. So this is something that is resonating. We just need to continue to get the message out there. Wonderful. I just wanna thank you for your leadership. Thank you for demonstrating this is possible. Thank you for being in the field, educating people. It's wonderful. Thank you, thank you so much. And I, I, I am so excited that records were broken at this conference. San Antonio is ready to host you. In a couple of years, when the Alamo and, and downtown is complete, please come back, get us on your calendar, and we will host you for another party. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. So we're launching into this episode of Connect This. And we're here in San Antonio. I've been here a number of times before, but it took I think seeing it more through Deanne Cuellar's eyes and learning more about the neighborhoods to come to appreciate, this city is awesome. This city is great. It's great at hosting this event. It's great at showing this leadership. And it's just really exciting to be here with a great panel. 
to kick off our first fully live crazy audience connect this so we are hey chris can i say something first of course <laughs> Um, I would like to say that I like these panelists than some of the other panelists we've had on this uh, <laughs> podcast before. I'm just, no offense to Travis or Doug. We love them. I, so the next thing on my agenda was to say that we miss Travis and Doug. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. We miss Travis and Doug. We totally miss them. And I've just lost the live stream on my device, so I have no access to the comments right now, but I'll get that going during the conversation. And we've got people that will work that out. Uh, I want to thank Council Member Villagran. That was wonderful. And we really have a lot of appreciation for the work that she has done here. Um, I want to thank Deanne. Done great work organizing with Diaza. I want to thank my team. I want to thank Rai especially. who's worked through a lot of headaches. When I'm like, let's just do this thing live. We'll work out. Rai's <laughs> like, yeah, that means I'll work it out. That's not cool. But he figured it out. We're looking pretty good here. We have, um, you brought me back in, I was not muted, that's gonna be bad. We have with me now, Autumn Evans from the city of Detroit. Welcome, I think this mic here is a good one to share. All right, thank you so much for having me and adding me to the panel. Uh, just wonderful to be here with the infamous Miss Angela. So I'm very honored to, to just share this platform with you and you, Chris. You've been a great friend to the I'm, city of Detroit. Yeah, I know. I'm the last up here, that's for sure. <laughs> Autumn, Autumn's doing great work with the city of Detroit. We're talking about deep in the community, organizing, learning what people need, respecting their power, yeah. and, and trying to craft a solution around that, which is not easy in a large city. Not at all. It's very complicated in a lot of different ways. I think that one of the biggest issues that we run into is really around um, just human nature and just really navigating um, the historical issues that have been with private partner relationships. So just being really uh, creative and, and solving for a lot of those pain points and making the city uh, be really a partner and just really gaining that trust. So that's really been my driving force of like the why is because I really want my city to see the city of Detroit as a partner and not just um, a regulatory issue. Yes, Yes. absolutely. So next to Autumn, and next to the insulting person who just upset the other half of our team is Angela Seifer, the executive director of National Digital Inclusion Alliance and repeat guest on Connect This. I am so pleased to be with you here. Uh, I am really very quite exhausted, but I couldn't turn up an opportunity to hang out with you all. I, I think that's uh, overstated and appreciated. <laughs> the National Digital Inclusion Alliance has put on a great event. I am so Thank inspired. Thank you. Uh, there are so many great people that have come out, many of whom have never been to a National That's Digital right. Inclusion event before, a net inclusion. That's right. We were amazed when our amazing MC asked everybody to raise their hands how long they, if this was their first time. And it was hard to count really that quickly, but it was over 50% had never been to a net inclusion. So it really told us a lot about the explosion of the field. Like we knew the field was exploding, but then when you see all those hands, you're like, wow, uh, we have a lot of work. So I wanna introduce Kim McKinley more properly. Kim, core a member of a repeating guest lineup of Connect This, uh, who just dissed Travis and Doug, who are other regular panelists every other week. Kim is the Chief Marketing Officer for Utopia Fiber. Kim is a technical whiz, as well as a marketing person, and just a really fun person to hang out with, get a sense of the business. And now she's on the Fiber Broadband Association board, and she's about to become too important, so enjoy one of the last shows where she'll hang out with me. I don't know if you know this, but I'm kind of a big deal, Chris. Kind and, of. Um, but, uh, Anyway, I'm surprised that you let me on a panel with Autumn and Angela because they actually know what they're talking about. So I, I feel like a little like disarmed right now of being here. But uh, I appreciate being here because I think it is like what you said, Angela, of that you had a 50% uptake of what you're seeing is that this is a very important topic and people don't understand um, how really how it impacts communities in a big, big way and what to do. So 
kudos to you and kudos to what you're you're doing in uh, Detroit Autumn. I I'm inspired and we've been watching you from afar for a long while. So, and uh, Chris, not thanks. in a creepy way. Well, mm, maybe in a semi creepy way, but. And Chris, it's good to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Kim, I'm so excited you came in for this. I, I did not want to do the show without you. Well, I mean, it was snowing in Utah yesterday, so <laughs> I feel like there was not really many options. It, it, I also, was, it was a hardship for Kim. Yeah. Kim, Kim, come on. Yeah, shoveling she went yesterday out of morning. her way to be here. Come on. Yeah, shoveling like six inches of snow or coming to San Antonio really hard decision but thank you for inviting me we also didn't want to miss travis and doug but <laughs> we had to um for people who haven't aren't familiar with this show the, the goal of this show is to get serious about topics in a not serious way at times uh we want to talk about real things real issues but in a fun way and maybe after a drink or two uh ordinarily we don't necessarily go that far but this is what we want to do at our live events <laughs> We want to invite the audience to participate. So if someone in the audience would like to come up and uh, make a comment, ask a question, we will maybe recognize you depending on how enthusiastic I am about you personally. <laughs> <laughs> but we are going to start uh, with uh, the question of um, what do we do now, right now, in the year 2023, a year that is not unlike 2011 or 2012 when the federal government was putting big money into making sure that people were connected. And we think there's a very good chance that money will run out. What do we do right now to make sure that when the money runs out, we can keep doing this work that is so important? I have lots of ideas on this topic. Uh, so I think we have to figure out who benefits from all this digital equity work and then get them to help pay in to create the long-standing uh, sustainable programs. Because if Autumn's folks work really hard to create amazing, amazing programs, and then when the money runs out, they all lose their jobs and all of those pro that programming grows away, this has been a huge waste. Like, yes, a bunch of people will get served, and that's great. But we have to go way beyond that. We have to think long-term. We have It's the bigger, right? It's the, it's the thinking bigger. And that bigger is sustainability. And it's figuring out who benefits and then getting them to help write some checks. But I don't think we're going to get checks because it's out of the goodness of their heart. We have to figure out the checks based upon whose bottom line it impacts and the data to prove that. I, I completely agree. Um, for me, sustainability past this moment is, you know, dealing with the nuance of digital uh, inequities and where it's where it's present and making those entities and, and companies or whomever invest because of their bottom line. Exactly like you said, like the healthcare field, you know, telehealth is going to drive their revenue. Then we should challenge them to invest into digital inclusion because the more people that are disconnected, you know, the the, the less amount of money they make and I don't understand why that's not you know the driving factor if you are you know constantly writing checks write the checks that will enable people to you know take a hold of your service so that's kind of the way we framed it um, connect 313 uh, raised a ton of money before the pandemic and we were able to do that because we had those conversations with you know your your healthcare systems with your mortgage companies right rock and mortgage uh, is the biggest um, in, uh, industry in, in Detroit and it's all about internet-based mortgages, right? So the more people that you connect to the internet, the more mortgages you can sell. And we were able to do that before the pandemic. And I think having those conversations and being able to draw those lines and show them the economic impact, I think that is going to be a way that communities can sustain the work past this moment. I think that Angela and Autumn, you are very much correct in your thinking. I also think you need marketing. At right. the end of the day, because I think you need to tell the stories of the people that this connectivity and why the money is being spent. Because if you don't do it that way, no matter the economic impact, no matter what you're doing for good reasons, it doesn't matter to people. You have to tell the stories of, and, and present them in a way that, that resonates to politicians. 
I 100% agree with you with that. I think that this moment is not just about getting people connected to the internet, but it's about empowering them and helping them to find you know, their voice. And so I really enjoy what the NTIA is doing as far as like uh, pivoting in the way that they do community engagement and really challenging states to be more collaborative. And the, the you know, additional benefits of that is that community members who probably never engaged politically, you know, are, are working that civic engagement muscle. And I don't think that's something that can be taken away from them once the money ends, right? So now you just go back and you keep doing it, rinse and repeat. So now you're going to keep doing the public comments. And now you're going to keep, you know, challenging your legislative, you know, representatives to advocate on your behalf. And I think that digital equity never really had that um, attention to where it matters. And I think that we can capitalize on this moment and momentum to keep going. Yes, yeah, so I'll stop talking. Sorry. I'm, I'm excited to hear that enthusiasm. I mean, we've seen this happen, right? Like Deb Sosha with Tech Goes Home. Uh, this is, most of what I'm gonna say right now, by the way, is lifted off of the interviews I did over the course of our, of our new show, the Building for Digital Equity show. We did like 10 interviews today, so I'm having no original thoughts. I'm just sharing what other people said and we'll be broadcast on that podcast soon. But when the money ran out, there were some programs that continued. Tech Goes Home in Boston. They had a broad base of support. They were able to continue it. Uh, Boston is a city that has demonstrated a commitment by putting money into digital equity. There's a lot of cities still who are relying on fellowships that are not paid by the city to do this work, right? We're seeing cities where they'll take philanthropy to be able to do this, but they're not putting their own money into it. Now, I understand there's some cities Baltimore, Detroit, Memphis, where we see a higher rate of poverty. There's a lot of reasons why they have many more issues to deal with. I understand there's a budget strain, but Minneapolis doing pretty good. Minneapolis is hoping Com Comcast is gonna solve this issue. We don't see that in Minneapolis. But Minneapolis used to have somebody, right? So there, and it all, it was because there was, uh, I don't know, remember CTO, CIO, one of them, was believed in this issue enough so that he had a full-time staff person devoted to digital equity. He's no longer in that role. Now there's no longer a full-time staff person in that role. But it's, why? It, why did they not refill it? I mean, because it was all about that CTO seeing the value, but it hadn't. They hadn't managed to get it into leadership beyond that. We've also seen sometimes where a mayor's office will think it's important. And then Nell, he'll have some, he or she will have something in the office. A new mayor comes in and they're like, well, we're not doing the issues of the old mayor. And they cut out the position. So politics very much impacts this issue, just as it impacts lots of other issues. And so I'm going to challenge you, Angela. How do we stop the politics to keep this on the radar for the long term? Which I agree. I deal with politics every day and it changes. And it's a very like tenuous thing of like new politicians come yes. in, they think they know better, they think they know what's going on. Yeah. So what can we all do to, to make sure this is on the forefront of the conversation? I think the answer is coalitions. I think it's exactly what they're doing in Detroit because that coalition will exist no matter who's in charge. And that understanding, having multiple entities around town working on the issue, caring about the issue, and talking to their council people and anybody else in town, general leadership, about the issue means if there's a changeover, the new folks are gonna hear before they're even in office that this is an important issue. Thank you for calling that out. I think that is one of the benefits of exporting our digital equity work outside of the city and really embedding it into the community where it's already happening. And so whether it's me or whomever else, we've already built this strong coalition. And like you said, and they, they're learning organizing skills to, to where whomever's in office, they, they have a voice. And as much as you want to ignore, you can't because it's there. And, and, and the investment is not just residents, it's also philanthropy. Philanthropy cares. They don't want their priorities, if they've invested millions of dollars, to just, you know, the city to not care anymore and just, you know, throw it away or, you know, deprioritize it. So I think, you know, having coalitions that are not um, 
that share the same values. I think that's really what I want to say. That, like, you know, have adopted the same values of why digital equity is important. Now we're advocating on multiple layers. There are things that Rocket can do and they can say that I can't say, right? So it's, it's a power play and it's a groundswell and it's things that politicians cannot ignore. And they rather they rather not touch it than to dismantle it. So that's really what I'm doing. Like, I don't have a staff. It's me. I just hired my boss on Monday. I'm really excited about her. You can go LinkedIn stalk her. Uh, her name is Christine Burkett. I'm probably gonna get in trouble. I don't care. Oh, I was like, have you has she been formally announced, or are you just no? I'm just this? you know, I'm just doing my thing. Like, okay, because uh, I'm really excited. I'm really excited about you know the new, her, but also like this is the sustainability plan for us. Is not to make it political. The moment I start raising up programs inside the city is the moment I put at risk the work of the full ecosystem. But I think that's a huge point that you just made, Autumn. Like, for Utopia Fiber, it was political for many years, right? It was a political stumping point for many. But when we became popular, mm -hmm. nobody stopped, everybody stopped campaigning on that platform. Absolutely. And that's exactly what you're saying, is when you make yourself popular and you get the residents and the citizens on your side, the politicians will become on your side, no matter Absolutely. if they believe it or not. And, and there's the success begets success, money begets money. I am experiencing that at NDIA, right? Like some folks what? work with us. We have You're rich now? No. <laughs> but we'll, get, we'll have one partnership and then somebody else, a, a, a partner, like a corporation or something will be like, we want to be in this successful, we want this successful partner to be part of us. So. I think we're seeing that at the local level too, right? And I, I suspect that your relation, the relationship of Connect 313 with Rocket Fiber is part of what helped lead to the additional partnerships because if they're in, well, we're in too. How much of this is driven by personality? Making sure you've got the right person and what are the skills that that person has to have? Oh my God, Joshua Edmonds, and I just had to give him his cater, you know, his whatever. He was great at leadership. And I think that every community needs a charismatic leader who can sell. My background is fundraising, so I kind of like have that mojo. But, you know, having someone who can articulate a vision and be able to translate very complicated or complex ideas and make it make sense for everyone, that is the person that you need at the helm of something like digital equity because it's so pervasive. So like being nuanced, so like really great leadership and really great coordination skills and a little bit of, are, do we cuss on this podcast? Uh, yeah, we, we do from time to time. From time, okay, I won't do it, okay. But a little bit of like, you, you I, have I don't to be give ranting. a F, right? Like being being willing to be like, I, I really don't care. This is what the mission is. And either you're with me and it, then great. And if you're not, then that's cool too. So um, I think someone who's willing to like be ambitious and, and strong because um, I do want to share like, you know, the city of Detroit, we received a $40 million of ARPA funding. And probably the most political thing that we're doing is um, doing an automatic open access network uh, fiber to the home, a pilot program in the city of Detroit. So um, during the pandemic, I had an area that experienced a 45 day internet outage. Like in a row? Like 45 consecutive days of no internet. Would you like to an announce the provider? That no, I'm not, no, no, no. Cause I want to make it home on my flight. So I don't want okay, to. I'm just, okay. I, I'm just asking, I'm just asking. No. Nah. Um, but they, they did it, they experienced a, a 45 day outage. You know, there was no accountability to the residents, right? It wasn't until one resident finally found a city contact. And why is it that in less than th three days of, you know, contacting your city employee, now all of a sudden everyone has internet? That, you know, if it was really an issue, it, it should have prolonged, but why did it take one phone call to one important person to get a whole uh, neighborhood back connected? So um, we are laying fiber as a digital equity issue uh, and we're going into neighborhoods where uh, traditional ISPs have said are not profitable and we're making it an, an equity investment 
Um, and so we are inviting um, ISPs of all types to get on our on our on our fiber network and provide services. Um, so that to me, it's not just an infrastructure thing; it's an equity thing. Access to internet is an equity thing, and it's not you can't coupon it away. But I think that's the point, right, Autumn, that you're making. And I say this every day of the week is I, I work for a municipal agency, right? Mm -hmm. Is that if you don't pass every home, that is like that is a starting point for digital equity, yes. right? Yes. And that is a starting point that most people don't understand is, yes, you have the other like the stool, like little legs of the stool that yeah. we need to accomplish. But if you, if you have that, at least in a equitable way, then yes. you can at least start there. But as, and I will give Deb Sosha some credit today mm -hmm. is, don't rely on a municipal network to get there. No. Um, and yeah. I think that is a very important point um, because if you do, then you might be sitting here for another 20 years waiting for digital equity to happen. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the word happen should not come after digital equity like that, right? It doesn't just happen. And it's, it's not the sort of thing where you just get one thing right and it happens. We're dealing with a, a very difficult challenge. And I think it is worth calling out that if there was a 45, you know, I was trying to think of a different number, like, but let's just say a four and a half day outage yeah. in a wealthy neighborhood. Oh, oh it would be over. Oh my like, God. They would have, they would call people out of retirement to start fixing it. Absolutely. And people would be credited to their accounts, you know, bills would be calm. So there would be so many concessions made. But because, you know, the business model of the ISPs is you go where the money is, right? And so, like, why would I care if, you know, a whole neighborhood that's probably, you know, the lower tier of services if they don't have internet, you know, mm -hmm. it's not really affecting my bottom line. And I think that, um, it's not, it, it, for me, the network is not just about connecting poor people to the internet. It's about all of us having a better internet experience. Yeah, yeah. And the minute that I lay fiber in that neighborhood, guess what? All of my ISPs are gonna be quick to want to lay fiber across the city of Detroit because you're not gonna wanna, you know, have to compete. And you're gonna wanna keep your customers that you already have. But guess how that benefits my whole city? Now the prices are gonna drop because you actually have competition. It's very it's very funny that I've seen in, when we build into new neighborhoods, how the prices drop from the incumbents. Yeah. Is it a miracle or what happens? Why is it happening? Did they just decide today that this was the price point they wanted to match? It, it, when you bring competition into these areas, digital equity changes, like you said. But does it, it I mean, I think this is, Angela was the first that articulated this to me, I think, is that we really have to understand that I think, and, I, and we'll see in a second if Angela agrees, that um, what I understood Angela having said before <laughs> is that we have competition will lower the price in, for middle income families and working class families. That, you know, so we're talking about going from 60, 65 to like 45 or 50 maybe. We're not going to get it down to 10 or $20 a month through competition policy, I don't think. So there's the, and, and to NTIA's credit, even though it's a little complicated, they did try to put this in bead, which is there's the middle class for affordability. So what any of us, to be fair, right, any of us can afford is not what a family that has a lower income can afford. And so we have to think about it in different kinds of tiers. And it gets really complicated if we start to do like percentage of income because then we expect a provider to keep adjusting and my head just starts to spin when we go that direction. So I do think it is a middle class affordability, but then it, there's the subsidy. I don't know how we get away from subsidy for low income families unless we're gonna start giving away internet, but there is a legit cost to internet. So th there has to be solutions that meet the needs of some folks and other solutions to meet the needs of other folks. First totally of agree. all, I, I would like to give Angela some credit for reading into the NCIA bead um, like bill that far to get into the I bet she, I bet she read notes that Amy gave her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I Hold on a second. Okay. I just want to say we got a comment that says striped shirt lady has it right. We don't have a Chiron usually telling people his name. So, Autumn Evans is the striped shirt lady. And we got a comment that says striped shirt lady got it right. So just so you know, striped shirt lady. I got it right. Well, that's, that, that's, 
thank you. Um, and green's my favorite color, so congratulations. You know, I'm I'm trying to like you know find my style. And I didn't know I was a Gap girl, but apparently like Gap is like my thing now. So shout out to Gap. But I definitely want to like challenge the thought that we cannot get internet to a loan of price where everyone can afford it. I've seen in Ammon, Idaho, and this is the community that we are patterning our automatic open access network after in an affluent area to get the prices down to $10 a month for fiber speed internet. And so this is just based off of competition alone, right? I would, I, I, I love Ammon, Idaho. Okay. I, I love them. But I also think that you have to be very cautious of understanding to protect the ISP too, because some of them have gone down to like basically nothing. And how are they doing their business model if they're making no money, right? Open access war. Open access war. And, and, I live and in the open access world, Chris. <laughs> but guess what? Then that's not my problem. And you have to change your business model. Like, if, if I built the highway, uh, am I? And I guess that's the question. And maybe the tension point when it comes to public funding and for me, right? Because I believe, and I don't know if anyone else, public funding should go and fund public good. It shouldn't just pass on to traditional methodology where we have seen the digital divide keep in perpetuity, right? So if we are going to take this massive investment and put it towards infrastructure, it should be, it should benefit the public. And so if this is the moment where ISPs have to re-examine their business model, then this is your moment of reckoning. It's not mine. But Stripe Shirt Lady's coming for you. I, I, I'm coming for you, Autumn. I think that I understand what you're saying because I believe that infrastructure, if, if the government's paying for it, the government should get good. But I think in an open access world, and I live in an open access world, I think there's like a, a two-prong approach, right? Because mm -hmm. you have to protect the customer experience too. Absolutely. Right? So if you don't have margins on the ISP side, then you might have a bad customer experience, right? So it's it's it's. I, I understand what you're saying, and I'm not. But guess who gets to judge that customer experience? The resident, like they get the cho they get to choose, right? And maybe I'm not well, hearing. I, so I, I'll just I want to jump in for a second because I feel like there's a, a kind of a middle ground here, yeah. which is which I think is important, which is I think both understanding that from a public perspective, we're trying to solve a few problems, and I think. One of the things I hear from you is we're pri we need to prioritize the needs of some folks that have been deprioritized for a long time. And if that makes it that ISPs have to be a little bit more daring and they have to work out their stuff, then that's okay. Like, let's, let's not prioritize their business models first, which I don't think is what Kim is no. saying. Right. But I think there's a really important point, which is that we need to make sure that we have models that will be sustainable for the long term. Because we don't want to build these fiber models and then find that we cannot find ISPs that want to compete on them. And that's where I think, you yeah. know, we need some experimentation. We're early on into this. Yeah. And so we need to keep studying it and figuring out what works well. I, I mean, I work for Utopia Fiber, the largest open access network in the country. And I'm not going to say we've done it right, right? I think there is room for improvement of where we can go. Um, I think Ammon has challenged a lot of beliefs in that aspect. And I wouldn't deny it, right? And I think. That is where in this space that we have to be very open to people challenging us yes. and saying we can do better and why couldn't we do better for our residents? And I think that is a very powerful statement, Autumn. And I mean, Angela is like nodding in between me and Autumn taking the mics, but she's agreeing. I want to I see if anyone in the audience was to, has any questions, any issues that they want us to address. Uh, come on up or whisper in Rye's ear and he will make it happen through the magic of Probably, I'm going to guess a uh, bitstream that travels for miles and miles to go this 10 feet. Uh, I don't know if they are. We don't have a great connection, so I think the people who are watching might be doing a little bit of work to do it. Um, we, have an, we have a question about um, whether this is an argument for multiple speed tiers. And I think this gets into a little bit of a, a technical question that we're not going to spend a lot of time on. But Travis often says that he would like to collapse his model to being gigabit or five gigabit or whatever. And kind of like, I was gonna use an analogy that turns out it doesn't work, so cut that part. Um, and, uh, and, and I think a, a question that I have that I wanna, I wanna get at in a second is whether or not we should have like a really great connection available for a high price and then some kind of other like good connection for free. And maybe we wanna talk about whether, you know, 
people in certain areas get that higher connection at a much lower cost or whatnot. But I think there's this question of what, what should we be doing and thinking differently? Rather than trying to take the cable model and tweak it, what should we be doing to think differently to solve this problem? But I want to note that we are here and this is an event that is sponsored by Vocal, which we are very enthusiastic about. We're, we're super excited that they were able to uh, sponsor this to be able to have us here. And so I wanted to pause there to say that and we're gonna come back and thank them again later. But what do we do about this question of should we be building toward free access? We've discussed this a bit in the past. So we have to be careful with a good level that's not actually good enough. Yes. Right? So if it is good enough, is it not good enough for everyone? So that's where there, there's an equity ickiness to like, it kind of makes my stomach a little turn a little bit um, of, of the different tiers. But there's also a, I'm also a very practical person, also recognizing that uh, corporate services are sold at tiers. So I think there's probably some kind of middle solution, but making sure that that good is plenty good enough. But I have a question for you, Angela, like, because I, we say this at Utopia Fiber, which we struggle with this conversation on our executive level every day, is that because you're economically disadvantaged, should you be broadband disadvantaged, right? Because nobody should, like, we go into the universal service fund of 10, is it 10, 1, 10, 2, whatever it is, right? That is not giving you equitable, equitable service to raise yourself up. So what does that mean to you as a, a digital navigator in this space? Right, no, it's very frustrating. Um, and I, I think we also see the, the same in the mobile world of um, folks pay, only getting a little bit of data. So it's different in the home broadband because we're talking about speeds, but I feel like, and I know I'm gonna add something brand new to the conversation. I don't know that we all are talking about mobile as often as we should be talking about mobile because we, I rely upon both. Y'all rely upon both. So we have to figure out how we make sure we have both for everybody. And so the data caps in mobile are an issue, but then also the speed tiers are an issue in the home broadband. So uh, I feel like when we talk about these um, tier levels, I think that good enough should be defined by the community. And I think that's something that I'm looking forward to, you know, through these digital equity plans. I want the community to tell me what they are considering good enough internet and using that as the benchmark for how they then judge ISPs offering. And then being able to go back, the community, go tell your ISPs and say, hey, listen, I've done my research and what you're offering me does not give me the ability to you know participate in the global economy or do whatever it is i need to do and so now that's not a conversation about city to isp that's customer to to business but i, I think it's an opportunity if we're talking about a, a tiered approach maybe it's not just about broadband access maybe it's about diversifying your services so maybe i'm going to pay more if you not only give me fiber speed but you also give me streaming services on top of that you know like maybe it, you know those are the ways that I'm, I'm hoping that ISPs think bigger um, as far as you know this tiered approach it could possibly be a variety you know a variety of services and not just about broadband but I'm gonna challenge you on them okay right I mean so what utopia fiber right now is that we see the majority of our customers signing up for one gig services right do so they would really know what that means and I think it's what does that mean to them because you're yes. saying because you're saying, like, th what do they want? But I think the problem I'm going to, re like, rebuttal with you is, do they know what they want? <laughs> and what that oh, speed means to Oh, that's some Steve Jobs way. action. But, I mean, I, it's a serious question. I mean, I, I get it. It's a whole thing that goes to Henry Ford, Steve Jobs. Yeah. All of these people are credited but, with saying people don't know saying, what they want. Yeah, like, you're saying that they should get, we, the, the market should demand what the, the, the providers mm -hmm. are offering, right? And I agree totally, wholeheartedly. But what I see is, do the, does the market even know what they want is the thing. Uh, and, and to that, I think this is what this moment is now, is to educate them on this is how it's been. And you tell me what you deserve. And I think that's what the conversation is. Where Detroit, like, my, like hey, you deserve better. Everybody says, oh, I want better. Like, hey, it doesn't have to be this way. You deserve better. 
and giving them that inspiration to, to then define what does better mean for you. And But it's going to take education. It's going to take exposure. It's going to take understanding systems that they never really wanted to touch before. But everyone complains about their internet service. So then to, for me, I'm like, well, what are you going to do about it? And let me tell you how you can do something about it. Am I going to you know, walk you through it and tell you what to do? No, I'm going to give you a process to think about it. And now you tell me what you want, and then you go get it for yourself as well. So they don't know what speed tier to tell you they want, mm -hmm. but they can tell you, I don't want it to buff. I don't want that, you know, thing to swirl around on my screen. Yeah. I don't want it to drop off when I'm in the middle of my telehealth appointment. Um, right. Like these are the, those are the things that they do know, but what I think we're still at an early stage of broadband in general, technology yes. in general. And we haven't made an effort to educate folks as to what these things mean. So it becomes a, oh, I don't understand that. Yeah. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. Oh, but you can. And whose responsibility is it? Right? Autumn's doing it. Autumn's taking responsibility. All of her colleagues are taking responsibility. All of NDIA's affiliates are taking responsibility. But it's not going to be what we have right now. Of who's taking responsibility isn't enough. Yeah. We need more leaders to take responsibility Absolutely. for teaching that. And and this is where I just I, I want to now I want to make sure we get this. Councilman Councilwoman Via Gran great example ran on this issue, and I think a number of us have believed this would happen, right? I mean, kind of like I think people don't appreciate how much a good framing matters, right? I mean, the whole the, the guy the rent is too damn high party, right? Yeah. Like if you ran, there's like people who have said if you would just run on ending like annoying fees, like ATM fees or something, you know, like you capture people's attention. You speak to things that matter. And I think there's too many people who have been intimidated and scared to thinking nobody cares that much about this stuff. But we see when the when polls are done properly, yes. people do care about this and they rate it high and they correctly perceive that if we solve this issue, it will make a lot of other issues that we are wrestling with easier to solve themselves. I just so want to echo that, you know, the importance of doing those pollings. Um, I can confidently say that over 88% of Detroiters feel that internet access should be a utility. Like, I use the same polling company that my mayor does. You know what I mean? Like, like, like this is what the people are saying. You know, we just have to invest in that, hear them, and move on it. Um, and, 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 there was another point. Maybe it's the drinks. I don't know. The heat getting back to no. me. But Chris, you're you said a lot water, of great things. Autumn, so. You're drinking water. Sure. Yeah, it's water. Green stripe lady is losing steam. Uh, no, I'm not losing steam. I'm here. <laughs> I'm here for the culture. Anyway, um, I, I, I really just, uh, just want to stress that this is just such a pivotal moment of just real transformation and systems change. And I think if we think about it that way and not just about Feed Act funding or whatever, but this is real system change. This is a, a moment in time to really galvanize people to take reins of their life and just know that they have power. Um, yes. And, yeah, so that, and, that, and that's what I want for my community. Um, I want them to feel empowered to create the, the life that they want for themselves. Yeah, let's just, I mean, I want to I get your perspective on this, Angela, because I feel like you've been working in this in a similar way, and I think. I don't know. Maybe you don't lay awake at night obsessing over these things. Maybe you have a healthy life. Um, I, I feel Unlike like, me. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> you don't sleep. You're out running around partying with this lady. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. My and best friend I, is here. I think, I think it's a, I, I want to see how that partying works. I think it's probably a lot of fun. So what I wanted to say is that this is a time of change, right? This is, to borrow a line from the expanse, this is the churn, right? This is punctuated equilibrium. If you wanted to like really make a big difference on internet access in 2014, it was very difficult. Things were not changing then so much, right? Yeah, even, so I was part of the BTOP world, uh, so I get a little- You were 11 at that point, right? <laughs> yes, yes, that's exactly correct. <laughs> um, but, and so I get a little testy when like folks hammer on BTOP, because I came out of it like, I don't think I wouldn't be where I'm sitting where I am right today if we hadn't had BTOP back then. Like that has led us, it was one of the steps to get to where we are. Um, and the digital equity then, it was about broadband adoption. It, it was 
and it was about public computing centers. It was not about affordability. No, but like folks didn't really talk about affordability. It was teach them how to use the internet and get them and explain the value because nobody understood the value, which we all know is half bullshit. Um, I wasn't supposed to say that. I'm sorry, Chris. Uh, now we're in so much trouble. Beep. Uh, I didn't do it either. <laughs> this time, I've watched the show, I know. <laughs> but, but I think that's, the, that's a big switch that we have now. Now we're talking affordability and digital skills, right? Right, and devices. Now we're looking at a holistic kind of a view of it, whereas before we were almost there in the project I work in, and I credit Bill Callahan, he was the one who said people just can't afford it, right? And that's in large part, we'll let NDIA down the path of affordability. There has to be a timing element. I was, I was arguing with Sean, a colleague of mine who's really sharp, thinks deeply about this. And he was saying, you know, he made a comment that, that someone else had also made about the mistake of commercializing the internet in the 90s. And the federal government should have yeah. built more networks out and built fiber out. And I actually think that that would have not been good. The, the federal government was, was not set up for this. Building fiber networks out in the 90s would not have been successful. People were not ready to take Did advantage of it. Did you see the utopia in 2005 when we built fiber <laughs> networks? I mean, and so the you can imagine try doing it 10 years earlier. Like, and so like, there's a certain element of like, you could see the right policy coming down the track, but you got to wait for the right moment, right? And, and this is the moment. It wasn't 20 years ago. This is the moment, I think. I, I agree. This is the moment. And um, I, I tend to think about, you know, digital equity as a spectrum or continuum, um, starting with that access and then inclusion. But once we get past this moment, now it's going to be about empowerment and the continuation of empowerment, because technology is going to continue to move. It's going to be, you know, access is going to be based off of your ability to, you know, resources. And so you're always going to have this gap between what's coming, what's new, and these people who are lagging behind. So digital equity is going to take a different face and really, I think, delve into use cases and, you know, um, you know, just job creation and, and economics and all of the things that can happen when you have really, really, really fast internet and everyone's connected. So I think that is like what we're planning for. It's still going to be digital equity because someone's always going to be left behind. So how are we going to continue these programs and having the operations, right, to continue to give people the information and the education they need to catch up? So I'm going to ask you a question, and this might be a controversial question. Are you because the host, of this, Kim? I mean, no, but I'm asking you a question. Ooh. You're welcome, Chris. I'm just over here. I just sit across from you so I feel powerful. <laughs> but you live in, like, it's a very blue versus red concept right now, I'm right? Sorry, a blue versus red concept mm -hmm. and that blue people like if the blue version thinks that this is more important but the how smurfs. do you get call them the smurfs the blue people the blue people blue the smurfs we love the blues but i mean it's like how do you get republicans to get on board with digital equity i think because it's not nearly on their radar i think as much as democrats and so how do you get there? Shall I preview our report that's coming out? Go for it, Christopher. <laughs> I, I would love, and I'll just say this, Angela, you can take it. I would love to not frame digital equity as a poor people's problem. I think that everyone, in, in a way, has a gap between their understanding of where they are now and where they need to be and how they are still experiencing a gap. And on, it can be on the wrong side of the digital divide at any point in time. So, so when we start framing it as this is a poor people problem and this is a tech, the speed of technology and the ability for all of us to catch up, then that is where I think we'll get away from I, the... I don't disagree with you at all. I just think that you, we think that way, right? But the, a lot of the, the country thinks in a way of like, well, this is not my problem. Like I talk to my friends all the time and they're like, well, I don't have a problem with internet. So why is this my problem? But, but it's also that your friends have already learned how to figure out the solutions to their own technology problems. So when we get that into our education system and we have ways of teaching adults how to solve their own technology problems, simply being tech savvy, right? If we can get to a place where that is possible, then it then it is it's everyone and and it's a struggle for lots of us if you don't have that person in your life or multiple persons that you turn to when you have a tech problem 
right? Then, then you just don't use it or you just make the mistake, same mistakes you've been making over and over again. And, and it really, it, it's the, the poor, poor, you know, it's a poor people pride in a problem. That's a piece of it, but it's also, there's so many others and it impacts all of us all the time. So I want to, I want to jump in on that for a second because this issue reminds me of schools in some ways. Why do people without kids pay for public schools? Right? Because I don't With think- With Ruthie Bader Katzberg, my cat. Yes, your cats spend very little time in the public schools, I'm guessing. <laughs> the, I don't think most Republican voters would think that we should change that system so that only people with kids pay for the public schools, right? I think most Republican voters recognize that even though a person may not own a, own a car, they should help pay for the streets because they benefit from all the commerce that comes on that, right? There's certain shared infrastructures that need to be paid for by everyone because everyone benefits by not having street urchins running around with no education. And, and it's also, I think this is the messaging that, because this is all about messaging, right? And it's how we keep fixing the messaging. And we're going to keep, all of us are gonna keep getting better at this, hopefully, keep talking about it. Um, but it's the idea that the digital equity isn't just impacting that individual, it's impacting the whole community. It's the same thing with education, right? Folks are more educated, they have better jobs, then safety is improved. And everybody wants safety improved. Yes, and the other thing I would say is that the report that I referenced that y'all just ignored, especially Kim, hurting my feelings here, it's a real report. Did it have big words in it? Because if it it's has gonna... big words in it, did I have a, like I get past page two. Rye was involved with it. Rye, Rye, is, Rye, Rye did you use big words Rye's in that? Dr. PhD Rye. Two, two, he said two big words. I, two I big can words. make it, I can make it then. This report looks at telehealth. It looks at the potential telehealth savings in an area of deep poverty where there are significant, like major medical costs that are borne unnecessarily by the healthcare system, by the insurance companies, by the patients, by the doctors. And we looked at that and we said, and we looked at the outcomes that are possible in terms of having really good, perfect, robust telehealth interventions. And then we said, what if we only did 10% of that? How much money does that save and generate? And you can build fiber networks in deeply rural area and provide digital equity training and have it paid for in a few years with the kind of savings you unlock with just 10% of what we know is possible. And we haven't scratched the surface of that yet. And we're not talking about the education benefits, the economic benefits, the quality of life benefit. We did, we did incorporate some quality of life benefits. There are so many benefits that come from this. And people think in their mind, this is too expensive. We just can't do it, it's too expensive. Anyway. It is not too expensive. I, I mean, I, I use this example frequently now because it resonates with Sean, and I feel like Sean knows stuff, and I want to. I want to. <laughs> when, when something resonates Where's with Sean, Sean, we lose Sean's, him? I can praise him because he's out of earshot. So, Minnesota dedicates more than a million dollars a mile to build a to build an off-road bike lane uh, in across rural areas. We're not talking about downtown. It costs an expensive dig and build. You're, you're all over the you're all over the West right now building. Most of your fiber is going in for less than $100,000 a mile, right? Well under that? Yeah. I mean, we're talking about a tenth of the cost of building bike lanes, of one-time infrastructure costs. We're just talking with folks that are running Project Waves in Baltimore, which is connecting low-income folks in, uh, in federally subsidized housing. These are the more expensive folks to connect because their devices don't work as well. They need more help with customer service. The ongoing cost to support those users there, $16 a month is what they told us is what they're doing for that. This is not an expensive problem. No, but it's about, like, and we talked about this over and over, it's about marketing, right? Yeah. Because like, I, I will always be the devil's advocate in these conversations because I agree with, what, with what you say, Autumn, right? About how you say it. But if you don't position it well for all parties in all political positions, Absolutely. it's never gonna get across the line. And you have to make sure everybody feels like I have a stake in this game. I, I would love to see a study done and like maybe some type of marketing campaign around the cost of being disconnected, right? The cost of being disconnected from an ISP standpoint, from an education standpoint, and tally it up and then compare that to the cost to lay fiber in your area. And once you do that cost comparison, then yeah, I would think that both sides will say, I'd rather choose the cheaper thing. 
um, I think, like you said, it's really about messaging. It's about them seeing the dollars and seeing the sense and it, you know, going past the emotional part, because clearly that's not it. You know, there's no empathy there. And then making it personal. Oh, that was a lot. Sorry. Um, yeah. Making it personal, making it OK. It's dollars, dollars and cents. So I agree. One of, no. the, one of the things we've seen is that the cost of building a fiber network to everyone is often order of magnitude close to what states, cities put into public stadiums. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, over the next 20 years, would you rather see everyone connected to a high quality connection? And we're talking about low income folks who aren't connected right now with a subsidized connection. We're talking about people who are then seeing new competition another 20 or 30 bucks in my pocket every month for nearly every family in that area. What is the economic impact of that versus that stadium, which brings in community pride, which brings in some events. But they don't see that, Chris. They don't see it. It's, I, we've had battles in a lot of our cities of there is a community center and they're willing to pay $30 million for a community center, but they're not willing to pay $30 million for a fiber network that lasts for, you know, decades to come. But I'm starting to hear an unnamed city is thinking about it and, no, and moving I, on. I, I think there are a lot of unnamed cities, but I would say this over and over again, that this is, it's the reason that Utopia Fiber was started in 2000. I've heard that the, that there was rumors in the 1990s, probably when you were talking about the federal government building networks, but our first customer was lit up in 2005. The reason that these cities endeavor down this path is because incumbents wouldn't deliver and they thought their citizens and businesses needed more, right? So that's the, the key is understanding in a, and I live in a very red, very Republican state and with 11 cities coming together saying, we want more for our citizens. And I think that's the, the bit of the challenge. And this that gets us to the, this is our moment kind of thing, because there are more places, more communities having that discussion than ever before. And when Chris says there's like unnamed cities considering this, yeah, right, that's real and that's exciting. And it comes about because of the pandemic, right? Like it was really COVID is what exposed all of this. It's yeah. what elevated the work that we all do. Um, and so as they're having those conversations, I've seen it, right? God has been part of it too. You see the, the conversation keep progressing to where they thought it was one thing and then it becomes another thing. And all of a sudden they're talking about building a fiber network. And that's not where the conversation started out at all. I, 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 I I think that it is just a boldness to it, right? I think cities need to be emboldened in this hour to vocalize and say, this is our commitment to draw a line in the sand and say, this is what we want for our residents. And we're, I mean, the city of Detroit, we're open to different models or, you know, what can happen after the fiber goes in. But if we set the standard and say fiber is the standard and anything other than fiber, I'm not funding it. Right. And using that power of our dollar in this moment to say, no matter what ISP say, no matter what happens, if I have the ability to make a decision on funding, I am not funding anything less than what has proven to be the best internet experience or infrastructure for my residents. Can I residents. have you come to all of my city council meetings and talk about that? I'm just asking, Autumn. Mm -hmm. like, I will send you an invoice, but yes, I'll, I'll go for you. We're going to be wrapping up in a second, so let's, let's uh, collect last thoughts. I do want to thank each of you, because for people who are watching the live stream, I don't know how much of this is captured. This is a loud environment. People are doing a lot of things. You all have remained very focused in this trial run of this new approach. I think we might have learned a thing or two about how to do this, including wired ethernet service to make sure that we have that available at the time. Uh, but this has been a very fun conversation. And I wanna know what last thoughts you have. Can I say one of the things we learned is that they're out there having lots of fun, but I think we had our own kind of nerdy fun over here. Yeah. yeah. I am not a nerd, Angela. I have no idea what you're talking Except about. Except for Kim. Thank you. Look Thank at you. her. Thank I mean, you. Come Thank on. you. Yeah. So final thoughts. Is that what we're doing? Wow. I, I just want to really thank Angela for, you know, the work that you've done in this ecosystem and, you know, just setting the stage for people like me, I'm sorry, to come behind and, you know, do my part to elevate the message that, you know, you, you've already championed. Um, so. I just really want to challenge communities to think differently about this moment 
and making sure that what you leave behind is actually worth something, right? They're making sure that we're thinking legacy and not just a moment. And I'm gonna keep saying this, we cannot coupon our way out of inequity. It never happens. It never happens. And so just being bold and audacious um, that in the ways that you can and finding champions to, to stand beside you uh, is, is just really what we need. Um, Detroit, we don't want to stand alone. I don't want to be the, the exception to the rule. I want to see, you know, fix the damn internet, become, you know, a national thing the same way, you know, the rent's too damn high. Like this can be a movement that goes beyond just a Detroit thing, just a San Antonio thing, but we can really like band together and really see real systems change. And, and I, what I love about it is we can still be a capitalistic, you know, whatever, but we can do it differently. We can absolutely do it differently and creatively where everyone now can, can, can have the means to pursue their dreams. And the internet is where that happens for, for a lot of people. So those are my final words. Thanks, Chris. I love, I love I mean, your final words. Who wants to come after you, Autumn? I'm like, nobody oh, I'll, wants to come. I'll break it up and I'll ruin the moment by saying, I feel like what we need is a beaver movement to fix all the dams. Fix, up, fix all the dams? Is fix that what all I the said? Dams. Okay, yeah. that wasn't oh, even a good joke internet. when I've been oh. drinking. That wasn't even a good joke when I've had a cocktail. Okay, so, so one of the people I talked to today, she, t I'm not gonna, I don't want to get her in trouble. I don't want her to friends to abandon her, so I won't say who she was. She said she likes my jokes. Does she drink a lot or do a recreational? Uh, I, I think she has an unhealthy life. Okay, fair. <laughs> I, I would like to say that this is our legacy. At the end of the day, this is our legacy. This is why I wake up, as Rai told me today, at like 4 a.m. and I go to bed at like 11 p.m. is because this is our legacy, this is our moment, right? This is our time to make a difference, but we have to sit there and listen and we have to understand and not think we're right, not think we have the best solution and, and, and be open to what the future holds because, I mean, my cat is 11. She's not gonna like the internet. We're probably not gonna go there, but for my nieces and nephews, yes. this is what it is, yes. right? And for the children of your nieces and nephews, Absolutely. the decisions that are being made right now that are building networks, will resonate for decades. I hope my, my family stops procreating. It's not going well, but thank you, Chris, for that positive thought. I'm just really thrilled to be here with you all. Like, I, we, we're in this, mo this legacy, this moment. We get to be in this moment. Like, how amazing is that, right? We will be the ones telling the stories to the grandkids that the grandkids don't wanna really wanna hear. <laughs> right, because we'll be proud of what we did back in the day. Absolutely. So I would like to thank a whole bunch of folks. I would like to thank Vocal for making this possible. All these folks that are out here hanging out, having a good time, building relationships that are going to make this difference. Uh, everyone who's going to be up tomorrow morning for the first uh, plenary, that's going to be, those people deserve a special thanks. <laughs> Angela? It has been wonderful. I remember when one of the times that I was in Columbus, we met and we were talking about how to get you a serious grant after you'd already been doing really great work and trying to figure out how to get foundations to recognize. And now you've received the largest grant that google.org has put out. It is well-deserved. And, and I think there are many more to come for the great work your team is doing. Um, as someone who is now working with, with a six, on a team of six people, I cannot imagine how hard it is to be responsible for so many more people and the great work that work that, that they were able to do on the teams that, that are happening at NDIA. So I wanna thank all the NDIA folks for the hard work that they're doing. Uh, Kim, uh, I'm enjoying this last time I'll see you. Uh, oh, I have to I'm see you again? Not hanging out anymore with you. Oh, okay. I, I had to pick and Travis. I just got, I just got broken up with on a podcast. <laughs> I choose, I choose <laughs> Travis right and now, Doug. Autumn doesn't want to be here for this breakup. Right. <laughs> yeah, we're locking them in as a. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Autumn is very inspiring to see what you're doing in Detroit. It is so hard. One of the things that we are watching as cities are working through the challenges of trying to take these important dreams and figure out how to make them work with city procurement pro approaches under the face of 
of very smart people who are trying to undermine what you're doing yeah. for their own reasons. And so it is inspiring to watch this work move forward. Thank you for doing that work. And I want to I want to thank everyone else. But my my team is so great to work with. I don't want to go on too long. We're gonna wrap this up. Um, uh, I, I was want to do a final shout out to Deanne Cuellar, who I think is not here right now, but has been doing work for 15 years here in San Antonio to to lay the groundwork for events like this, to make sure the city is taking a responsibility for connecting people. And it is an exciting time to be doing this work. So we'll be back in a week or two for another episode of Connect This.